It's my honor to um, introduce our keynote speaker for today's event. Dr. Jay Gambetta is IBM Fellow and Vice President Quantum Computing, where he is in charge of IBM's overall quantum initiative. Dr. Gambetta was named as, as, as an IBM Fellow in 2018 for his leadership in advancing superconducting quantum computing and establishing IBM's quantum strategy. Under his leadership, the IBM quantum team has made a series of major breakthroughs in quantum computing. The IBM quantum experience, the world's first cloud-based quantum computing platform, Qiskit, an open source quantum software development kit, and the IBM Quantum System One, a family of quantum processors for clients. Dr. Gambetta received his PhD in physics from Griffith University in Australia, and he is fellow of the American Physical Society and has over 130 publications in the field of quantum information science with over a staggering 37,000 citations. Dr. Gambetta, thank you for joining us today. Please welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a talk about IBM Quantum um, with a focus on what we're doing with our partnerships in Japan. I put this slide up and I'm really pushing this concept of quantum centric supercomputing. To me, as we learn about quantum computing, it is really the power of Quell Quantum works with classical computing that we're going to actually see how it becomes useful. And so when we say quantum centric supercomputing, what we mean by that is building a future heterogeneous computing system that is powered with quantum as an accelerator for certain problems. I'll give you a little bit of that intuition, happy to take any questions. Um, but um, on that, I'll, I'll talk through basically how that we think that this is only possible um, with basically building a vibrant international uh, collaboration. So IBM in Japan is actually probably over a hundred years old. I did a, with, uh, with my colleagues, we did a quick search of things. The first uh, Kanji uh, keyboard was made in 1979. Uh, the first uh, miniaturized uh, tiny fit within your palm uh, computer was made with IBM working in Japan. And of course, we're very proud from IBM of um, our new uh, two nanometer um, technology in the semiconductor industry getting integrated into the rapid, Rapidus. So from our perspectives, Japan has always been a, a great partner. And I'll show why that's also true as we go into the quantum stage. But jumping into quantum, I think it was said in the introduction, in 2016, with a combination of getting tired of getting asked questions by my colleagues to run things on quantum computers. I, I with my uh, good friend and colleague, Jerry Chow decided, let's put a quantum computer on the cloud. And so we, we, we how hard could it be? Turned out it was harder than we thought, um, but we essentially turned it on on uh, May the 4th, 2016. And within a week, it, it basically had several thousand executions. And today it gets over uh, I forget the number, it's in the billions per day, totaling over 3 trillion executions since we've actually put quantum computers on the cloud. This is how many times people are running quantum jobs on the systems we did. A year later, uh, that cloud programming was really a drag and drop sort of uh, do this. To make quantum useful, it had to be integrated and to be able to program. And we had the vision and uh, that the best way to do this would be open source. And so we released Qiskit. I would say today it's, I think the surveys say it's considered the preferred by more than two thirds of the people doing quantum programming, but it's become um, basically the way to program uh, quantum computers. It supports many different uh, hardware, um, but it allows people to do the research, to program it. It has a Python interface built inside its Rust for the technical people, but essentially it's a way of just simplifying programming a quantum computer. And so that's been our, one of our goals. And then after we put the first system on the cloud, it was really a research lab um, connected to a cloud. We asked the question, can you actually take a quantum computer and put it inside a, uh, a single thing? Can you remotely service it? 
And that was what the design philosophy behind the IBM Quantum System 1, which is shown here. Could we take everything from a lab, fit it in an 11 by 11 foot box, remotely, completely operate it, calibrate it? And it turned out successful. We now have um, uh, up to eight announced, I think there's four deployed internationally all over the world. One in uh, Japan, which I'll talk about later, one in Germany, uh, one in um, uh, Cleveland Clinic in the US, and one in, uh, one in um, uh, uh, basically just south in Beaumont, which is just south of Montreal in Canada. Uh, part of the great thing of the team, we installed the one in Germany and Japan in the middle of COVID. We had to do it remotely. And so that actually taught us how to do it. I remember uh, using WebEx and watching and talking to the team as they installed it remotely. And we explained basically how to do it and get it up. But that has become the building block. I'll show you what the system two is later. But uh, I think of these as key moments in quantum computing. Early on, uh, Professor um, Kohei Aito had the vision that if quantum computing is going to matter, we have to focus on industry applications. So six years ago, he um, basically way before any agreements were in place, he said, I want to know how we can use quantum hardware to look for Japanese uh, uh, with Japanese industries on use case uh, prototypes. And that um, has grown. Since then, um, Professor Gonakami, sorry, President Gonakami, and now taken over by President Fuji from University of uh, Tokyo, um, realized that we also need to push for scientific applications, create a supply chain, create the componentries. And so we set up a test center and research center in University of Tokyo. And as I mentioned, there's a system in Shinkawazaki in Japan. After this, I'm actually getting on a flight to go visit all our key partners in Japan. And now there's over 19 industries with just this group publishing over 65 papers. I'm not going to go through them all, but it can be everything from the compiler that was mentioned in the panel to new ways of doing reservoir computing. And it really shows this sort of using a quantum computer to see how we can actually get the most out of it. So now I'm going to flip to our roadmap. One of the things that we take proud is for, since basically uh, 2019, when we first published the roadmap, but we've had it internally. Every year we've hit everything on that roadmap. So continue to green tick. There's two dimensions of this roadmap. Basically continuing to increase the hardware up to now at the end of this year, uh, end of last year, we announced that when we think error correction will come in. But more importantly, we focused first on scaling to a large system, 100 qubits. And now we're focusing on how many gates can do, be done. For those that are not technical, the quality and accuracy or getting beyond what you can do with classical computer depends on at least having 100 qubits and running very long circuits. At this point, you're definitely beyond what you can do with brute force classical computing. At this point, you're definitely in the regime where pen and paper algorithms work. And so this kind of lays out our vision of how we're going to create uh, the hardware capable of getting us towards uh, quantum compute. And then the other dimension, and I'll give come back a little bit to this, programming quantum computer is essential. Yeah, the software, the middleware, how it works with classical computer, simplifying the abstraction layers, because I, I, I think uh, it, I heard it in the panel uh, as well. Um, when this field started, a lot of people wanted to test physical properties. Now a lot of computer scientists want to actually integrate it and look at algorithms and actually eventually theoretical physicists or chemists explore how it matters. So simplifying how it goes up. And like I said, the Japan partnership has been going all the way along in this. So this year, what we're aiming to do is actually bring AI to quantum computing. So when you want to program quantum computing, you just basically say, I want to run a chemistry. And at the end of the year, it will generate the Qiskit code for you to be able to run that. Transpiler service. I made up the word transpiler to explain compilers. I don't really know what it meant, but it meant mapping circuits to circuits because uh, I didn't want to, uh, it to interfere with compilers, but we've created AI powered transpiler service. So the power of AI is actually getting built really, really into simplifying how to use a quantum computer. And of course, we're working towards uh, 
taking the heron, which I'll show you that we demonstrated last year, and deploying it in our, there's a difference between demonstrating something and making it so clients and users can use it. I learned that the hard way. By getting the heron into a point where it can be continuously operated, working at the performance it can do. And at the end of the year, our goal is to get it to a point that it can run 5,000 operations. <clears throat> we don't think the qubit, I know the physicists will argue, I actually don't think, we don't think the qubit is a debatable. We're happy with our qubits. We're happy with our gates. The Heron is a beautiful device. It's, um, it's fundamental properties now are uh, continuing to the point that we've demonstrated the qubit inside it, which is called the transmon in isolated can get up to three milliseconds, but more important than measuring error rates or coherence to make it programmable or simpler is reducing the crosstalk. This device has been now engineered away because it got so many, I think there was an animation that played, so many layers that separate the qubits from the IO that we can suppress the crosstalk to the point where it's not even measurable. So this is our last year's Eagle device that if you were doing two operations simultaneously, you had crosstalk in the Heron, this is uh, virtually unmeasurable. So we're, we think that this, this is the processor we wanna scale up. From a systems perspective, I realize I probably should have had the big video on the system too. This is a real photo of the system. The difference is the first system we designed was to take a quantum computer from a lab to be able to deploy it commercially. We quickly realized you hit a scalability problem. You couldn't fit enough qubits, enough electronics in. So this design philosophy was how do you make it modular so we can keep expanding it? Each one of these Inside here is uh, essentially three cryostats connected uh, to make the, the core cryogenic uh, environment and it can keep tessellating out. It's on a hexagonal for those that have seen graphene, you can basically tessellate out the same way. On the sides is the electronics and we can keep, the electronics have to be close enough that we can do fast uh, uh, continuous feedback and like conditional measurements are close. Behind it has classical um, processing that does our error mitigation and eventually our error correction. But we this is about four times the size of the system too, a system one. If you ever get to Yorktown, New York, and you want to see it, you'll be amazed. That's a real photo. That's not a rendition. So we actually take, I like to make with the team, we always pride making things look good. And then about four years ago, we started projects for different types of codes. We'll be, we'll be starting to lay our uh, vision out for error correction, but essentially um, we have a plan, we call them LDPC codes, the community also calls them that. They can be very, very efficient, but you can start to realize a way that you can get modular, essentially we call them modular processes, either connected, pretty original with M couplers, C couplers, L couplers. M stands for medium range, L for long range, C for cross, but essentially this allows us to basically realize a code and now to scale up through modularity with the processes. And this is what we plan to demonstrate uh, going forward. So from a technical point of view, yes, there are engineering challenges. And I can spend a long time on them, um, but from using a quantum computer, I would say this is this plot to me is one of the things that worries me the most. Since we put the quantum computer on the cloud in 2016, Averaged over every, this was done by, um, uh, I think, Asaga University by uh, Professor Fuji, did a uh, analyze of all the different papers using quantum hardware. And it, it, he plotted the uh, blue dots. It actually has a quadratic fit, perfectly quadratic fit. If we take our internal, external, uh, our data from what our external users are using and ask how many qubits are people using, it's actually less qubits than you could simulate on a 1981 uh, PC. So most of the things that people are using on quantum computers today is running small scale simulations. And actually this is why a lot of people think it's useful to build simulators for quantum computing. I'm strongly opposed to that because if you can simulate it, you shouldn't have done it. And you actually don't learn about how the algorithm scales. So our goal and what we set up to is we need to see a disruptive change of this. I was so happy that we last year got uh, working with the University of Berkeley, did a paper where we uh, simulated 
a quantum circuit that was 127 qubits, 2,888 gates long on a quantum, ran it on a quantum computer. It's beyond what you can brute force simulate. We looked at a trivial problem known as the icing problem, which turns out there are approximation methods to do it. But more importantly, we're now running things on a quantum computer that are beyond brute force that to compare it to classical methods, you have to compare it to approximate classical methods. The point of that is quantum has now become a tool that I don't a priori know how to predict. And I got to explore how it is we use in these different applications. We term this utility. And when I think of that, I think you're running something around 100 qubits of about 2000 gates or, or longer. Since then, there have been many other papers that are doing the similar scale. So if we go back to that plot, this has definitely happened. And so our quest is how do we simplify it? How do we make it so people can run large enough quantum circuits that are beyond what they can do? And over the next couple of years, I do think we'll see many examples of this happening. Uh, we have some internal projects that I've been, I'm really excited about that are gonna come out. Um, and I've seen some of what our partners are doing. But this is more a, a quest for we need a lot of algorithm development. I'll say a little bit more of that later. So if we put this together, we got, as I said, error correction comes in. We feel pretty confident that we have a path to getting useful quantum computing. One thing that all of those, all of these papers had in common is I like to call it the tyranny of the single circuit. And what I mean by that is in the community, rightly so, the way you write a quantum algorithm is you write down a single circuit and that single circuit must run on it. This leads to ridiculously large numbers. There is results that are emerging if you start to run multiple circuits, glue them together, you can start to use exponential, you get an exponential overhead, but it might be less than the classical uh, way to simulate it to glue larger problems together. I could spend a long talk on it, but essentially it is bringing classical methods to quantum computing to allow you to run multiple circuits allows you to look at things that are more complicated. And that's exactly what we meant by quantum centric supercomputing. To show, I always, I like this because at the G7, as a picture of my CEO, uh, Dario Gill, the director of all of research, uh, and obviously our partners in Chicago in uh, University of Tokyo, for a for-profit company to put real money in to pay for research done in certain directions is a statement of how confident we are by doing that type of research, we can start to see applications happening. So we committed over 10 years, 100 million to both University of, uh, 50 million to University of Chicago, 50 million to the University of Tokyo to do sponsored research in the topics of, if we're gonna build this large quantum centric supercomputer, we need more algorithmic research, we need supply chain and componentry research, and we need to basically speed up the way they do it so we can lower the price to build a large system, but also so we can actually show that we can get these um, applications that can run on it. And so to continue along this roadmap, I think it's not possible without external collaboration. To dig a bit more into that, oh, I forgot I had these slides. So, I kind of already said this, but IBM alone cannot bring quantum computing to mainstream and create a vibrant ecosystem. I do think it's only possible with partnerships with forward thinking institutions and government supports as, as it's emphasized by that, um, by our commitment with the University of Tokyo and uh, Chicago. So to dig into it, obviously we've got quantum processor design. We're gonna keep engineering and building larger uh, processes. We need more algorithm and software we need supply chain and enabling technologies such as we heard this morning, transduction to connect these qubits together or even better, um, better uh, superconducting cables uh, that can get the signals in and out much more efficiently. And we need to keep the workforce. So I just wanna take a few minutes to jump into each one of these. We are not gonna partner on the first because that's from, a, from, my, from IBM and that's our core business. We're actually very open and partnering on all the, all the rest, and I'll show you some examples. So as I said, a lot of these algorithms are running multiple circuits. So thinking about how algorithms can change a landscape, which is like, this is, I call the single circuit landscape. You kind of need a hundred qubits. Maybe you see these numbers for chemistry, which is around the yellow, 10 to the 10, to the 10 
for the material models about 10 to the 6. Basically, a nice theoretical paper was shown where you could take even the most famous algorithm, Shaw's algorithm, and by running multiple circuits, you actually reduce the overhead of doing it. There's actually numerical things. So that's exactly the type of research that we're sponsoring and doing. And the goal here is because we can't simulate anything outside of the shaded line, you need quantum hardware to test it. But where we can prove things analytically, we've got good ideas. Quantum compute, we all know quantum computing is going to matter. It's going to hit so many things. But how do we fill this white space in? And the only way to fill that white space in is a combination of doing algorithmic work with hardware. And that's exactly what I would like to see a lot more done of. So that's the first one. The second, uh, with Rikin, we just announced that we're actually putting one of our quantum computers right next to Fugaku, because now we can actually start to do some of those algorithms that, are, uh, that I didn't have time to go in, like this matrix product formulization allows you to reduce the, um, the error bounds by running a lot of classical calculation, or this back propagation allows you to run longer circuits by using HPC to go backwards. They use a lot of um, HPC calculations mixed with quantum to really push you to the limit of what you can do. So how do we start to architect a software that connects the best we can do with classical with the best we can do with quantum? And I'm very excited by the vision that uh, President Gonakami, who now leads Rikin, is, is pushing forward to bring and test these different modularities of quantum computers mixed with HPC. And so as we go forward, we'll start to see more HPC and quantum computers working together. One of the things that we, we, because we believe in the partnership, we don't run these technical working groups. We support them with a lot of our technical partners, but to really get that community going to focus, not on the physics of the computers, but the applications. There's now um, four technical uh, working groups that we partake in with key partners from Japan and the US, like Materials, Rikin, University of Tokyo, University of Chicago, Oak Ridge. They've actually put a white paper out. You can go read it on their perspectives of how materials can matter with these as we bring these down. With Cleveland Clinic we're, and Yonsei uh, from South Korea, we're looking at, and as well as Chicago and Toronto, how it's going to matter for health and life science. For high energy physics, simulating the fundamentals of that is very interesting for um, the high energy physics. So Desi, uh, University of Tokyo, CERN, they're putting the ideas of can we use a quantum computer to model that. And of course, optimization we heard about before. How do we represent quantum optimization? My personal belief is I'm always a little bit skeptical of optimization with a quantum computer, um, but not enough to not say that we shouldn't go that way because the devil is in, in, in the ratio of uh, how fast it, it's overhead. But I think the only way to get more algorithmic research is we really need to get these, these and many more working groups going. So for supply chain, I think at the start of this is a photo from our system, uh, 2017 system, I believe you, it was the one that was shown. You probably remembered it had all those wires. None of our systems have those wires anymore. It's all replaced with uh, what we call a, a flexible cable. It looks like a printer cable from the old, um, old PCs, like it's all flexible, but it has high density and you can fit more and you can actually get lots of them in. But essentially, how do you get better connectors, better flex cable, better isolators, low noise amplifiers, better cryogenics? The only way you can start testing these at scale is you've got to create an ecosystem where you can create basically um, uh, a way to design and test at a rapid way, get those cycles of learning down, get those engineering. And with the University of Tokyo, we've, ex we've set up a test system and they're working and they're exploring different types of things. I can't mention many of them, but we're the ones there like TDK and Oriental Microwave Components. These are going to be the key ways to make it be easier to build larger and larger things. And so from my view, um, we need a lot more in the enablement technologies. And this is a great example. Taking this one step further, Eventually, we're going to need design foundry models for these components. How can you actually go from uh, more hands-on testing to the way it works is similar in the semiconductor world? You design, you a vendor is very good at, say, building it, they build it, and then you can test it. And we're already thinking about how we extend the test bed to get towards these models so that we can go at scale. So 
uh, on the last topic, workforce. Uh, ever since I put the quantum computer on the cloud, we always contributed to open source. I hope you've all, if you haven't used the cloud, please go use it or do it. But um, we've, we've now got basically courses working with our many partners. There's 40 quantum, we call them quantum innovation centers, which are universities all over the world that are teaching students, have over 710 classes, reaching over 8.1 million learners. And with Japan and the key, uh, one of the key announcements we just made last year is education also needs to be in the language that the people are learning, learning it in. So how do you actually cross language barriers? So with Keio University, University of Tokyo, Chicago University, Seoul National University, and Yonsei University, we actually announced a commitment over the next 10 years uh, working with the IBM and on the core stuff we've got to train over 4,000, 40,000 students. And these are the students that are using quantum computing. So I think using quantum computing to explore those algorithms. So this kind of brings those four things together, supply chain, enabling components, algorithmic research, as well as the training of the workforce for the future. If you haven't checked out John Watrous's lectures, I totally recommend them to you. Um, he was a professor at University of Waterloo, who um, I never officially learned by him, but when I read his lecture notes, they're beautiful. So we actually got him to join IBM to simplify how to actually teach quantum, uh, quantum information. So on that, I think that's the end. The summary is, I think that as we go forward, it's the most exciting time. You're gonna see applications, but for us to get to the point that we can really get to this vision of quantum centric supercomputing, I think partnerships are key. I outlined our partnerships with Japan. I would argue Japan is one of our most successful partnerships uh, alongside with our partners in the US. And, but we, we, we've got them all around the world, like in South Korea, Europe, we have, we have the similar partnerships going. And you really see this momentum building towards actually, um, I think uh, the realization of seeing something useful with a quantum computer over the next couple of years. Thank you. So that was a really great talk. Thank you. I, I learned a lot. Um, so I'm sure the one question you get the most often is, you know, timelines for when the most impactful applications will come online. I won't ask you that question because I'm sure you get it all the time and are sick of it. But I will ask you, um, how do you think about timelines in the sense, how do you think about balancing the long-term research that will pay off in 10, 15 years versus the nearer term applications that might you know, generate less revenue, but quicker? How do you think about balancing Yep. free and low cost demonstrations to the public versus things that will really generate a lot of revenue. You know, what are, what are your thoughts on all those balancing timelines? So I am, when you think of bringing a technology to market, I like the line that I think many people that are looking at AI probably think things like uh, NVIDIA is an overnight success, but that's like 20 years in the making. Uh, with our roadmap, you see that it went back to 2016, essentially, all the way up to 2033. So from our view, we've always thought 20 plus years. And when you think on a time scale of 20 plus years, and we're eight years into this journey, um, that allows you to balance the right things. Right now, the focus is got to be showing and learning from industries about use cases that matter. So outside of what I showed today, we work with... Um, either with our partners or by direct with over 60 different in, in, uh, industries that really know their problems, either in chemistry or finance. And so that allows us to get our experts to understand that. And then um, the other is, um, I think the right business model at the moment is how do you bring quantum computing as a compute resource uh, to, to the world? And so as we continue to go forward, bringing that and simplifying it so that it can do that type of research seems the right, right way to do. I think if you just did your modeling based on a year, it's not going to work. So you have to plan over a long course of time. And uh, we, don't, we, we have never not planned to like do all the research and then you, you commercialize it. I think what you're seeing in other fields like AI is research is commercializing more faster than ever. So if you're not thinking about commercialization and research in the same equation, you're not actually allowing yourself to innovate. Mm -hmm. So this is why we've always had from day, uh, from when we announced the IBM quantum program, 
a focus on enterprises, users, as well as um, uh, delivering our, our roadmap. Were you nervous about releasing the roadmap? Was it no. was there controversy? It's an ambitious roadmap. Um, we have had our internal roadmap um, since, uh, since basically we put it on the cloud and um, we've continued to deliver on it. It's just when is the right time to make your internal roadmap public. And um, from my perspective, I feel we can keep iterating on it. Have you encountered any, um, well, I'll ask a broad question then I'll ask a narrower one. The broad question is, are there any governance or policy issues that you'd like to convey to po any policymakers who may be listening to this webcast? Um, I'm not sure what you're getting at with that. I guess, um, well, so my more specific question was, You've sold a computer to Japan. I'm curious, were there any kind of bureaucratic challenges, any red tape, any issues with you know export controls or red tape on either uh, either country's end that made things challenging? Or do you think there are any regulations that might you know make it challenging to spin up this kind of brand new technology? Well, I think that is a question that we have to allow our government colleagues to work with us. Um, but the leadership that was always shown by um, President Gonakami-san uh, when, when he was at the University of Tokyo um, was more focused on how do we actually get the compute resource there. Um, and, and it basically, it was, it was our, our desire and we, we went and followed all the things uh, that you need to. But um, I think as this goes forward, this question is going to be more and more complicated but um, but that's that's a longer discussion than I can just answer yeah. at this point. Uh, maybe we just need to focus on if we are going to build a quantum computer, making sure that we can get the componentry and the supply chains from uh, countries that share similar values. Um, we need to make sure that that is simple as as simple as possible to allow us to execute at the speed we need. Thank you. Uh, one more question, then we'll open it up. It seems to me that IBM is unusual in that you are one of the companies, perhaps the company that has the most comprehensive, you know, coverage across the ecosystem in that you do fundamental research, search, very applied research, kind of qubit level research, also networking, integration, scaling up. You also do consulting, use case consulting, um, you know, cloud offering. Do you think there are synergies there from being able to do all those different aspects will eventually need to be done in a mature ecosystem. You know, uh, maybe this is a bit of a softball, but do you think that, that is an advantage that IBM has that you have kind of that much capacity across the different levels of the sort of stack of quantum computing? You're asking a strategy question. And from our view that when we thought of this, it's a full approach because if you think you know what clients want, you're not, you're not listening to clients. So you need to understand the use cases that they're working on. That is important information. If you just build something for what clients think, then you don't have the possibility to surprise and innovate. So all of these vectors come into a complicated thing. And by not having one part of that, I think it's, uh, it, we wouldn't be able to do what we wanted to do. So that has been the strategy from the start. Uh, we are uh, from from expertise. Like after I um, put it on the put it on the cloud, uh, I got a lot of personal mentoring from people from the system side, and understanding engineering and cycles of learning has been one of the key key system side. And then I also got mentoring from a lot of people on the consulting side to understand the the use of, of mm -hmm. the client. So that has been our strategy from the start. So I think our strategy is working. Uh, so if you're asking, is it the right strategy or not? I, I don't know how to answer that. No. I, <laughs> um, great, thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll turn it to the audience here. I saw a hand shoot up in the back. Hi, I'm Jason Lee. Um, so my question that you um, mentioned about commercialization and nowadays, um, <clears throat> Like for example, AI. Uh, lots of bottlenecks actually uh, was from uh, if the chips uh, were commercialized and was able to be manufactured in a way that be used in the commercial world, 
And uh, you mentioned in your slides that you IBM and you have been um, collaborated with lots of institutions in in South Korea and Japan. I'm wondering uh, what uh, the capacity of your uh, organization uh, work with uh, Taiwanese institution like National Taiwan University or Academia uh, Sinica. Thank you. With who were the two? NTU and Academia Sinica. From Taiwan. Yeah, because you know. So Taiwan has a quantum innovation center. Uh, working already with us at this point in time. Oh, is that is that uh, the Industrial uh, Research Institute in Xinzhou next to TSMC? No, it's uh, NTU, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? Um, uh, yeah, in the back row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adara Carver. I want to thank you for speaking today. You're like the Steve Jobs of quantum computing um, in my mind. Um, back in law school, I had the opportunity to use KISKIT um, to the cloud in my little dormitory, and I ran a, a quantum oh, computer. Nice. I thought it was really nice, really cool. Um, and at this point, we have the advent of AI. And we've just seen from chat GPT is an AI store, which makes it simple for users to, sit down, to understand the um, how to use the the tech the AI for different components, maybe generating an image or some other some other thing. Is it, is it will we see um, IBM Quantum come out with something of that nature, where there's a simple store for maybe quantum apps um, to you know, solve like the delivery problem? So that's it. It's it's a it's a great question. Um, when you when you got to think about the technology mixed with what the current uh, users can do. Uh, to give you an analogy, we started with pulse level access because a lot of people wanted to char characterize machines. But as you started to talk to um, people, say, from traditional HPC, they really want to think of, um, tell me how to run a library. Like, tell me how to run a quantum circuit. And so that's why um, we've, we've gone already one level up the stack and created uh, what we call primitives. I envision as we go on this journey and we understand what libraries matter, we will need to create higher low level functions and things like this that will make it simpler. But it's gotta be correlated with the current technology. If you go too fast from the technology, um, there's too much hidden in the black box for, for, for it to be unless you have like a chat GPT moment, but I don't think quantum is at that moment yet, maybe in the next couple of years. But the moment we're at right now is how do we mix quantum circuits, large quantum circuits and libraries of them with, with uh, het uh, heterogeneous compute, so say classical compute, and how do we get the middleware? How do we actually get containers or things where it's easy to put something on a quantum, easy to put it on a classical and mix between it? Uh, that's much more analogy to, let's say the hybrid cloud current uh, moment that is existing where you basically you can have, um, you can do something here, then put it on that cloud or you can put it, but now make it about compute. Can I run this near the quantum? Can I run it next to the cloud? I, I would love to see the, the thing that you're envisioning. I have a similar vision in, in a few years, but I don't know what it is yet. Thank you. We have a question from online. Um, what can governments do, such as the uh, federal government or the Japanese government, aside from funding or even FFRDCs, what can they do to bring the uh, quantum uh, ecosystem forward? Well, I think, um, I think, I think, personally, I think they're doing a pretty good job at the moment. Um, I would like to see them get a little bit more, like, 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 I think the, what we have five NQIs in the US, uh, most of University of Tokyo and a lot of this was supported by the, the Japanese government. So at, at the zero level, they're doing great. Um, I would like to see more acceleration into the computer science uh, area. And I would like to then see uh, more use case and algorithmic development. I think um, we have a lot of physics development. I'm not saying stop the physics and the qubits, but I, I would like to see more of a par uh, between software uh, focused research and, um, and, and hardware. And I think it's, you, you already see it, it's getting closer, but um, we need to 
for quantum computing to realize. And I think what was shown the Valley of Death, I can't, I, I'm a disbeliever of the quantum winter or the Valley of Death or whatever your favorite acronym, sorry. <laughs> uh, but to minimize the effect of that, we need a software engineer. And, and not just like research, compiler research, uh, algorithmic research. And part of the problem is on, like if you do an analogy to GPU and you think of a quantum computer as accelerator, for those that don't uh, know the tech, the technical is actually a pretty good analogy. But GPUs had the ability to have classical emulators of them before you went and executed them. Quantum doesn't have the ability to have an emulator of it. So we have this problem that we have to develop a compiler, a way to use that. And that is, that is not possible without a tight integration of hardware. So rather than like build it and then work out how to emulate it, then you could actually go and deploy it and, and see it. We actually got to do the compiler and we've got to do the algorithmic research like in, in code, code like in like in continuous with running it on the hardware. And that is that is a little bit different. And I don't think appreciated how difficult that is yet. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, in the third row. Wait for the microphone, please. Hi, uh, I don't quite know how to formulate my uh, question, but it has to do with oftentimes the military uh, complex has helped, uh, you know, develop uh, technology. And so far, I've not heard anything about that aspect. And I don't want to be negative about the military complex, so sometimes it can be. But is there anything about uh, quantum uh, uh, future and our current military of different states that uh, you could yeah. talk about? We didn't. So IOPR, uh, DARPR have always been key funders of quantum technology before the DOE and the NQI acts. Um, DARPR, I believe, was first. Like, don't quote me on that. I'll, I'll look at see if that may know the history a little bit better. When I came to the US in um, 2007, uh, my originally was Australian, um, IOPR was the prominent funder of all the research. And, um, and so the US has had a long history of uh, funding this as a technology. Um, now with the NQI Act, there's a lot of uh, funding still from the DOE and things like that. But I think overall, it's still funding. Um, if I look from IBM's perspective, we're at its heart in the research division, we're about compute. We always have, like we build computers. And so um, we, that, that's why we're, we're doing it so, so much from ours is we, we see that this is a key to the future of computing to build this as a compute. I think the cross section of that as we get close to a, um, a machine that is capable of um, running Shaw's algorithm, we'll come back to the question I was just asked that I tried not to coherently, uh, well, not, maybe incoherently uh, not, not answer is going to be a fun question that is gonna to have to have all the different parties at the equation. My hope is we can do it in a way where we don't undermine the ability to make the commercial reality of this technology possible. And I didn't get time to mention it in my talk, but that's why we also have been at, from the, the get-go from 2016 as well, developing quantum safe algorithms. So uh, algorithms that cannot be broken by a quantum computer. We're proud of the fact that three of the four algorithms that were down selected by NIST actually tie to IBM in history. And I have a commercial program that is actually working with many institutes and enterprises on how to get uh, quantum safe. But all that coupling is a complicated uh, equ equation that uh, is starting to get discussed now. And that's why the loaded question was asked. <laughs> If I could just briefly plug Rand's research, if you want to learn more about post-quantum cryptography, look at that table right there. We have several reports on it. Okay, uh, let's take another question from online. Um, how does the process of orchestration work? If you're given a mathematical problem or any kind of problem, how do you know, how do, how do you split it up into, okay, this is going to the CPU, GPU, and the quantum processing unit? Well, that, that, that's the funding we just talked about. 
um, on, the, on the serious side, I, I look at most quantum algorithms, I like to say there's four steps, map a problem to quantum, compile and optimize it for hardware, execute it on hardware, post-process the results. Um, we know a lot of library, we know a lot of circuits uh, that, that do. So one of the ones that I think is a really nice result is this way of doing chemistry uh, is, is known as trotterization. I don't want to get too technical, but you run this long, uh, circuit. What the teams did, they showed that if I could run multiple circuits and add them together in different ways, I could make trotterization error of 10% uh, come down to 1%. So that means I could look at a much bigger molecule by just running multiple circuits together. That gets to the mapping question. How do I actually break it down into the subparts, run them, and then tie them together. I call it circuit knitting. I think on the roadmap, I, I imagine making tools for circuit knitting uh, a couple of years out, but that gets to, that's the research to, to get that orchestration. And it's, it's really, really hard research. Question from the second row. If you could just wait for the microphone, please. So companies like Google, IBM, AWS, they obviously have a very large existing business that could back a lot of the research. Um, but a lot of smaller startups can't. And so we have a lot of problem with the quantum hype in the industry. So how do you suggest that uh, maybe some, how do you suggest that the, the industry kind of balances that hype versus uh, being able to sustain funding? especially in light of the different uh, uh, capital availability for research, depending on what types of companies. Get good results. Uh, look, um, if you spend all your time worrying about the hype, I don't think you spend enough time getting the results. Uh, so uh, we try to make sure we, and I agree I'm from a larger company, um, have a, that's one of the reasons I put the roadmap out to be transparent. Um, but the results are good, what are going to speak for itself. And so we have to get the results. And I think if we get the results, uh, you, the, the hard question will disappear. Um, I don't see it any different to what AI was like many years ago or a new technology. Like uh, in the end, what, what works and what people see eventually brings them value is going to be where where everything goes. So um, I've always tried to not get into this this debate. I just tried to say, let, let's just keep going forward with the technology. I think if you try to deal with it, you may overcompensate or you just create, you, like if we get enough people talking honestly about the results they've achieved, I think that's the right answer. Let's take one question from online. What sort of uh, regulations do you think we should have in order to avoid bad actors misusing quantum computers? Sort of like the AI policies. So, so um, we've always had into our contracts responsibly use clause. I think when it was, it's been in them from the start. That's just one, one step. But I think that's, a, again, another complicated question that is a function of time. As the technology changes and as we get more capable machines or libraries of things to do, we, we need to understand the implications and the security of what it can be done. Um, I, at the moment, I think the only bad actors we see from our cloud service is they use it to bit mine. And so we've worked out tools to get rid of bit mining. But like uh, as as it goes forward, and you 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 can do it. That's that's part of the dialogue that needs to happen between the industries, the government, and uh, and the ways that we can build security into the stack. Uh, question in the audience here. Hey, thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, the IBM challenge is the hundred by hundred challenge. I'm curious, um, you mentioned circuit knitting, like some different, if you could name maybe two or three techniques that, that you're excited about um, kind of getting to the path to better quality like NISC uh, computers. Well, so yeah, I, I renamed the 100 by 100 5K 
because everyone I was confused what I meant by 500, so 5,000 gates. Uh, we are working on improving the a couple of revisions of the Heron to to allow to allow that it's around 3,000 now. Uh, then um, then error mitigation techniques, but it comes back. If I was to think of, um, I, I didn't really get time to, to say this. If I was to think of how do you achieve getting something on a quantum computer or showing something useful, I like to think of two 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 major steps. One step is, can I run a quantum circuit faster than brute force simulation? Or can I run a quantum circuit of 5,000 gates? We've shown now we can run a circuit faster than brute force uh, simulation. So I call that the engineering. And we're going to keep making them bigger so they can get to that. But the harder question is, how do I map the problem to that? And that's what the 5K or 100 by 100 challenge is, is what circuit should we run? And so we know that this year we're going to get to the ability that we can execute a quantum circuit and give you through error mitigation, a unbiased, uh, an, a good estimate of the outcome. I don't try not to go into the technical uh, terms. So then what is the circuits that we should put on top of it? Um, can they be, I, I think they're gonna have to be not random circuits because random circuits we all know uh, I think whether you call them barren plateaus or they create uniform distributions, they quickly um, become uh, like there's no signal in them. So it's going to have to have some type of structure. But if you put more structure in, then classical methods are easier to simulate it. But that's the battle between classical methods and quantum. So now you assume you have this tool, we can run it. How much structure do I put it in so that I can do circuits that say you've got some type of structure that might matter for chemistry or structure that might matter for, I, I personally like some of the AI proposals, but that type of structure, but not enough structure that is easy to simulate. And, and that, that, that is part of the challenge that we're trying to do with a lot of our community of users to do. Uh, question in the second row. Uh, what, if any, implications are there for blockchain? Um, I'm not a blockchain expert, but I believe blockchain uses, um, uh, does it use RSA or elliptical curve for its encryption? I can't, can't, don't remember at the top of my head. I don't have to look it up. Elliptic curve. I think, I think it's elliptic, not, yeah. Um, and quantum, it does have algorithms that break that. But the current estimates of those type of algorithms. If you just always think in terms of a quantum circuit, is a few thousand encoded qubits and 10, uh, I forget what it is, 10 to 11 uh, gates. Uh, so that's, that's if I'm talking that we're at 5K and eventually, and, and we'll get to 10 to the nine, uh, that, that kind of gives you a, a feel for it. That being said, those algorithms through research are coming down and getting more efficient, like there are, a new algorithm that just um, uh, changed the way we think of Shaw's algorithm, it will apply to elliptic as well. Uh, it hasn't been done, but we in the field think looking at the way he did it, it should just apply, it, it should have a similar structure that will apply. How, how that comes down, we don't know, but that's part of the research. Let's take one last quick question from online and I'll reserve my moderator's privilege to ask the very last question. How do you foresee the United States government employing quantum computers? Do you foresee the military, the Federal Reserve, CDC, the post office? How do you go about that? I think that's a question for the United States government, but I see, I see the DOE, um, its mission in the Office of Science is to, is to explore and to use compute what, what is a uh, Frontier was the last one that a supercomputer that was, was it Frontier was the last one that was installed? I think, yeah, and, and Argon is working on R1 as well. Uh, the history of HPC with the DOE is, is something the US should be proud of, that it's continued to get the best compute uh, continuously. And so in my opinion, uh, that should not change as we go down towards building quantum as part of the future of HPC. And so if we can get, if they can continue their aggressive roadmap of always 
building large compute that has always had rundown effects on many different things, that is a great thing for the institutes like the DOE and things like that to do. But to, to directly answer that question, that's for the US government. And then final question before our break, uh, to return back to the theme of the conference, what do you think are the next steps in cooperation with Japan or with other countries? So um, I kind of hope I touched on it. I think, um, I think I heard a question from the audience that asked about energy for quantum computing in the, the start. So today we use FPGAs. FPGAs is about 45 watts per qubit. If you were gonna scale up to hundreds of thousands of qubits, that's ridiculous. But there is no reason we cannot use ASICs or other types of things that are doing. From a fundamental, the energy consumption of quantum can be very, very low. But we have not started as a field to build efficient control and IO uh, for these future systems. And so when I think about as we scale and build these large processes, we're going to hit a wall of simplifying. Like I keep looking at this picture, which is an old picture, and it scares me because there's cables <laughs> everywhere. They're not the ones we build now look like they look like this was um, this picture is a. Uh, uh, 16 qubits, and that's the amount of wires for 16 qubits in, uh, I believe it was 2017, maybe 2018, this picture was taken. I, I, I forget. I know it. I know it's IBM, so I, I, I can, can talk like that. And I, and I know the IBM. chip because I, I was part of designing that chip. So, so I, I recognize a lot of parts, but it's, it's all this uh, flexible cable in the picture I showed. But like, if you don't change the way that we're building the componentry, it is, uh, it's, it, we're, we're heading towards not a good, good part. So getting things, we already discussed the algorithmic, but really focusing on componentry to simplify communication between processes, to, to simplify IO, to simplify um, and bring down the cost of the uh, control electronics. Uh, these are all great things that I think are gonna be important. Uh, now I can give you the business reason. When you put this system together, people probably think the fridge costs the most. The control electronics is, the, is where I spend all the money. So like if we don't bring down the cost, it's going to be uh, price to price. So as, as, but this is, as, as we go forward and we show more value, you'll get research to bring down the cost and that will go. But the next step I think the governments could do is how do you get that flywheel going? Dr. Jay Gunn, this has been a really great conversation. Thank you.